to this talk on severe acute asthma for the acute and emergency paediatric module MDM 158 as part of the master's program at Brighton Sussex Medical School. Uh, I'm Carmel and I'm going to talk through the subject of severe acute asthma and I, as you can see here on the slide, I'm using a variety of sources of information including the British Thoracic Society and SIGN uh, guidelines, the guidelines produced by NICE on the diagnosis and monitoring of asthma, additional material from Asthma UK, and also uh, a particularly useful source, Healthy London Partnership, a very useful pointer to use in the future for lots of different sources of information. I would highly recommend that. So what I'm going to cover is a little bit of the pathophysiology. I want to focus a bit of time on this word, wheeze, and how we use it, both in terms of symptoms and signs. The issues about the difficulties faced in diagnosing the younger children, particularly in those under the age of five to seven, and some of the hurdles that we have to overcome in their assessment. It'll be useful to cover a little bit of epidemiology to give you a bit of background, and the main part of the discussion is going to be on the evidence-based approach, particularly the first and second line treatments for severe acute asthma and I'd like to then finish on a bit about what the future might hold. So this is a slide which I'm going to use to demonstrate some of the pathophysiology and on the top left hand you'll see uh, what represents a more normal airway with the mucus on top, some epithelium including goblet cells, the basement membrane lamina propria which is in between the smooth muscle and the epithelium and then underneath the smooth muscle additional glands and soft tissues and as you can see in the bottom left that there are three main kind of conceptual components uh, which lead to bronchoconstriction. First, and the most well-known, is clearly the smooth muscle bronchospasm. And you can see how in the bottom left-hand picture, the smooth muscles is also a little bit hypertrophied, which can happen in longer-term or chronic asthma. And in the middle, in the lamina propria, you can see increase in eosinophils, some macrophages and some mast cells, and this represents the additional inflammation uh, which we see in asthma and of course this does include not just swelling but also um, some airway edema and then lastly the increased mucus secretion so that's thicker mucus which can also lead to plugging and with smooth muscle there is also the concept that in asthma the muscle is more hyper-responsive in response to uh, external triggers. And as you can see on the right-hand diagram, with the smooth muscle, there are blue cholinergic nerves uh, which are involved in the causation of smooth muscle bronchospasm. And exploiting this in the form of the metacholine test uh, which assesses the degree of bronchospasm caused by triggering this cholinergic pathway. It, and we can measure the level of bronchial reactivity, and bronchial reactivity also is a hallmark of asthma. Now, inflammation is thought to trigger the smooth muscle bronchospasm, and as you can see here in the right-hand diagram, inflammatory triggers can be quite varied because the allergen can be aerogens, uh, which can be either irritants, such as tobacco smoke or pollutants, or they can be allergens.
pathogens, such as house dust mite, animals, pollens, occasionally food, allergens, or they can be other forms of inflammatory triggers, such as viruses, or even the physical environment, such as cold air. And airway inflammation has several components, which are interrelated uh, inflammatory pathways involving quite a lot of different cell types and inflammatory mechanisms. So for example, uh, eosinophilic involvement can be associated and is associated with mild to moderate asthma. It's also seen in severe asthma, but in more severe asthma, there tends to be an association with mixed eosinophilic and in neutrophilic inflammation. And if uh, neutrophilic involvement is predominant, this is associated with very severe asthma. Steroids are known to cause eosinophilic apoptosis, i.e. cell death of these eosinophils, which then would reduce inflammation. But they appear to prevent neutrophilic apoptosis, which might explain a little bit about why in very severe, potentially life-threatening asthma, steroids don't have the same positive benefit or effect that you see in slightly less severe cases. Now, the concept of excess mucus and mucus plugging is an important one. Healthy mucus, which is needed to entrap particles and its clearance via the cilia and the cough mechanism, is essential for lung health. It contains about 3% solids, which are predominantly glycoproteins, and this gives it a consistency of around egg white. Dysregulation of the liquid or increased secretion can increase the concentration of solids to almost 15%, and this isn't so easily cleared. Uh, mucus plugging has been recognised for over 100 years uh, as a significant element of asthma, but I think with the more recent use uh, and advent of bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories, this element is perhaps less well recognised than it used to be, except um, in PICU, where the use of mucolytics, and in particular DNAs, has really quite revolutionised the duration of invasive ventilation in potential fatal asthma. So just to sum up, there are three main components, excess mucus, increased inflammation and bronchial hyperreactivity and bronchial smooth muscle constriction. If uh, we view the pathophysiology more in the form of a mind map, this helps us see that the uh, presence of bronchoconstriction uh, is key in thinking about asthma. However, there appears to be a significant difference between younger children and adults in that in adults it is more reliably the larger airways that constrict, so this can be more easily measured uh, in forms of drop in FEV1 and drop in peak flow. But in children, it appears that the smaller airways tend to be affected more, and so FEV1, even if it were to be able to be measured, isn't as affected and therefore isn't as reliable a measure. Also, a significant proportion of children who have wheezed up to the age of five appear to grow out of this tendency. So the concept of multi-trigger wheeze may be a useful one in the under fives. We can see why using IgE uh, measurements or skin prick test to assess uh, IgE reactivity uh, is advocated in younger children when trying to identify asthma as the cause of wheeze. We can also understand how uncontrolled chronic inflammation can lead to long-term changes that are associated with more severe asthma, and that is hyperplasia of the goblet cells increase in the smooth muscle in terms of hypertrophy uh, and the T-cells become much more Th1 driven. 
So this produces a bit of a vicious cycle. I mean, aerogens and pathogens more easily entered into the epithelium because the epithelium is more porous as a result of the chronic inflammation. Now, interestingly, however, trials show that early use of inhaled corticosteroids do not appear to impact, at a population level anyway, on developing severe asthma. I'll just leave you a short while to ponder on the interrelationships here, as you can see, between bronchi the idea of bronchoconstriction, um, inflammation, and how chronicity impacts on this. So we know that uh, asthma is predominantly associated with wheeze. And of course, wheeze is a symptom, uh, together with cough and dyspnea or breathlessness. And it can also be a sign together with an increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, increased evidence of worker breathing or hypoxia. And it can be expiratory or both expiratory and inspiratory. So it's really quite interesting how this word is used and how it can cause quite a bit of confusion uh, in fact. So I'm going to highlight a particular study that was done quite a while ago that really illustrates how we might approach this subject. Almost 20 years ago now, uh, Sheila McKenzie, a, an eminent respiratory paediatrician in uh, East End of London, uh, had a look in more detail about parents' views of children's symptoms uh, using video clips. And the reason that they did that was because there was an emerging concern that uh, people didn't always understand what wheeze meant, that there was different understanding between clinicians and parents. Um, and of course, the basis of diagnosing asthma is often based on a history of wheeze. So it's really important to be clear. So what they did was they uh, video clipped about 55 patients, all under the age of seven, uh, with a variety of different noises. So wheeze, stridal, snoring, and stertal. And they uh, whittled this down to 10. Video clips were about 80 to 100 seconds long. And they sampled 190 parents, 82, so almost half uh, were parents of children who had either asthma or wheeze. 56 were parents of children with other respiratory type problems and 52 who had no history of respiratory problems. Three quarters of were mums, just over half were British and about a quarter were South Asian and 10% were African, which is fairly typical of a kind of London population. And this is a table from that paper showing how they coded the parents' responses and how they decided to interpret them. So at the top, table one, uh, you can see that if the parent used the word wheeze or asthma or whistling, this was designated as a correct label for that particular symptom or sign. And that if they were able to locate it as in the chest, as opposed to in the throat or the nose, then the location uh, was deemed correct. If the parents called it either rapid or just shallow breath or chesty, then this was grouped as vague. And if it was either labelled as normal breathing or snoring, as you can see there, it was labelled as wrong. And, and it, you know, if it was labelled as being in the nose, then the location was incorrect. So that's how they decided to interpret wheeze. And below, in table two, you can see how stridal uh, was denoted as correct if there was using the term sucking in and out. Um, but if it was wheeze, then it was wrong. Or if it was snuffly, it was vague. Snoring was likewise uh, uh, looked at as stertal 
which is essentially excess Qatar in the back of the nasopharyngeal space. So that would be designated as correct if it was described as congested or with a cold. So here are the results, and um, let's have a look first at the top table, which is table five. And this is the percentages of parents labeling and locating wheeze, all the other noises, based on whether their child has uh, asthma, uh, or, and you know, that, that's asthma diagnosed by a doctor, and that's group A. Or uh, if the children had other respiratory symptoms, stertor, stridor, snoring, then they were group B parents, and group C is the parents in whose children there were no respiratory symptoms. And so uh, we can see that in parents who had respiratory symptoms of wheeze, they were able to label wheeze correctly 63% of the time. And the number able to do this doesn't appear really to be influenced so, uh, too much by their experience. In that parents of children with other noises were getting it correct, uh, labelling wheeze at around 55%, and those without any respiratory symptoms were labelling it around 58%. And so 30% were vague or didn't know, and 7% got it wrong. And that's quite a significant proportion, especially in that in the those parents who've already got children with wheeze. So with other noises, the correct label percentage was between 40 and 56%, which suggests that they're even less accurate with the other noises. However, the parents did appear better at locating the wheeze in being in the chest more correctly, and they were able to locate uh, even better with the other noises, so stridor or stertor or snoring, being from the nose or the upper airway, and they were getting that 78 to 85 percent of the time correct. If we look at the uh, bottom table, table number six, uh, we can see that this is grouped by language, and that language does make a difference in that if English was your first language, then you will 75 percent of the time go to label it correctly, and 38 percent if they're another language is your first language. But the uh, rate of response, which was wrong, is very similar. So it suggests that they're more likely to be just be a bit vague rather than actually wrong. So it's around, you know, the use of language. And it didn't seem to make as big a difference in locating wheeze correctly, in that 72% located wheeze correctly, if English was their first language, versus 65% if English wasn't their first language. So, really, that suggests that locating rather than labelling uh, noises was universally more correct. And this is particularly true for the other noises, uh, so stridor, stertor, and snoring. And whether uh, parents have experienced this or not doesn't make a big difference. So that's really interesting that there's a large proportion of parents who cannot label wheeze correctly, in the, but they are better at locating, uh, which suggests that maybe asking a different kind of question might prove more fruitful than just whether their child is wheezing, perhaps something more around where that noise is coming from. So, just to summarise, it shows that asking parents to locate the children's breathing sound is generally more in agreement with the clinician's understanding of what's going on than trying to get them to describe it, especially if English isn't the family's first language. And the suggestion that some form of audio-visual presentation from which to select the symptom. Um, so, what I tend to do, for example, is to physically make the noises and get the parents to decide which ones are more like the ones that their child has made 
um, if there's no signs at the time that I see them. So the importance of uh, understanding this is clearly a lot of the epidemiological data and parental responses and a lot of information that's been gathered that way is based on what parents understand of WHEEZ. And we just need to be mindful that uh, the level of understanding is perhaps not as clear. And it perhaps not even within health professionals, in fact. But that's not really been systematically looked at as far as I'm aware. So, if we're going to look then at numbers and epidemiology and things, then of course, uh, I guess a little bit difficult to know how many children really do have asthma, um, as opposed to weeds, as opposed to viral induced weeds, as opposed to multi trigger weeds, which we're going to grow out of. But currently, it's estimated that over a million children in the UK have been treated for the symptom or sign of weeds or asthma. We know that it's hard to predict who will continue to wheeze and therefore develop asthma. So the younger you are when your wheeze starts, the more likely as a population you are to grow out of it. And so it's almost impossible to predict at the age of, for example, one or two, whose wheeze will continue and develop into a more asthmatic pattern who's going to grow out of it. We just know that around 60 to 70 percent will grow out of it by the time they're about six, and a further 10 to 20 percent by the time they're seven to eight. What epidemiological studies do, however, tell us, and this is particularly from uh, what NICE have looked at, is that in children who have died from asthma, 90% of them have some form of avoidable factor which uh, affects the final outcome and that amongst the largest number of avoidable factors are behavioural and adverse psychological factors and that's actually in almost 70 to 80% uh, of those patients and unsurprisingly the larger number is within the 15 to 19 year old age rather than the one to five year old age. So here are a couple of graphs showing uh, death from asthma. So the left hand one is age 0 to 14, uh, number of deaths from asthma in England and Wales from 2001 to 6 and you can see the numbers aren't particularly huge and perhaps there's a, a trend towards reduction um, but the numbers are too small and that explains the spikiness of that wave form uh, rather than a smooth line um, so it's a bit difficult to really know whether they're definitely reduced uh, significantly or not the right-hand graph uh, is a little bit more reliable in its findings. You can see that the red line and the blue line are the numbers of children under the age of one to four or under one who have been diagnosed as asthma and who have died in their really very low numbers indeed. Uh, compared to the sort of 15 to 24 year old where between 15 and 20 children a, a, a year kind of die. So that's kind of the target group if we're going to affect uh, reduction in mortality. So now we move on from epidemiology to the concept of diagnosing asthma in childhood and what SIGN and BTS in 2016 have stated is that in under five-year-olds it is difficult to give a definite diagnosis of asthma so the approach taken by most clinicians is to decide on the likely probability 
And that is based on the factors seen below, which is age of onset of the weeds, you're more likely to have asthma if you're a boy, and assessing the severity and frequency of the previous episode. So the more severe and the more frequent, the more likely you are to develop asthma. ATP is an interesting one because it's quite common, so it doesn't always help differentiate. But if there's a history of eczema, and in particular if there's maternal ATP, then that increases the chances. Uh, so they've advocated the use of uh, skin prick tests or IgE measurements to help stratify the risk. So if these are positive, then you're more likely to have asthma if you have particularly if you have frequent episodes, so you're more likely to benefit from inhaled steroids. And then assessing the triggers, so what are the kinds of triggers, and if it's virus only and well in between, then that's less likely to develop into asthma. In 2017, NICE have suggested that a similar approach, which is a structured clinical history based on these factors, uh, be the way to manage particularly the under fives and to make their assessment and that regular reassessment and regular review is going to be vital particularly if we're going to assess the responsiveness to short acting beta 2 agonists so for example salbutamol and if we're going to focus on what exercise symptoms they've been having uh, how much nocturnal cough, so if it's more than three nights a week, then it suggests chronic airway inflammation, uh, which might be amenable to inhaled steroid. And particularly if episodes of cough and wheeze are uh, more than three times a week, this uh, suggests that it's more likely to be asthma, and therefore inhaled steroid may be of benefit. So that's around the diagnosis. In terms of acute, severe uh, presentation of asthma, the sign guideline suggests this kind of approach for deciding the level of severity of acute asthma. And you can see here the different categories of assessment, so how breathless they are in terms of their ability to talk, what their oxygen saturations are. Now, clearly, peak flow uh, is an issue and a problem in that most children under the age of seven are not reliably able to do peak flows. And those over the age of seven, unless they've had a bit of a practice and done some, then it's going to not be uh, that particularly reliable. So the other two parameters, heart rate and respiratory rate, uh, are reasonably straightforward. But obviously, if children have already had any salbutamol, then the heart rate becomes much more difficult to assess and interpret. In terms of uh, deciding whether it's life-threatening, they suggest that any child with silent chest, cyanosis, or poor respiratory effort, exhaustion, or confusion, and SATs below 92 should be considered as having potentially life-threatening asthma, especially if they can't complete sentences in one breath, or too breathless to talk. So to me, this feels light in terms of validity of how to assess it looks like you're going to rely mainly on saturations and whether they're able to talk in sentences and their respiratory rate, um, which feels a bit crude. So what uh, we've done at the uh, Royal Alexandra Children's Hospital is we've used what sign have suggested, you know, obviously about whether you can or can't speak in sentences, what the level of consciousness is, um, and, you know, used exactly the same criteria for life-threatening. But in addition, we've tried to make the assessment a bit more robust in using something called the PRAM score. Now, I think the reason
reason that we've chosen this particular score is that out of all the available uh, asthma scores, it scores the highest in terms of validity assessment in a systematic review. Um, and in fact, all of the scores available have relatively insufficient validation for uh, how well they assess the breathlessness in wheezy children. And really, there's also insufficient data or assessment on the responsiveness of this score. And what we mean by responsiveness is whether the score changes appropriately as you get better or as you get worse. So we can begin to decide whether they're mild, moderate or severe, depending on the PRAM score. And if they have additional features, um, when they have a severe PRAM score, that would suggest that they have life-threatening features. Now, that's the acute immediate assessment. On top of that, we have to layer the uh, how well their control has been recently, so the degree of exercise-induced symptoms in the recent past, how much nocturnal cough, how often they've been breathless, and how often they've been using salbutamol, and also how limited their activity has been. Because we know from children who die from asthma that uh, their recent control is often poor, and this overall assessment then help decide what's going to be our first and second line treatments. So assessing the chronic symptoms is really vital at presentation of the uh, asthmatic child. And here's a lovely example of how to assess the recent symptom control. And this is produced by Asthma UK. It's called the ACT, or the Asthma Control Test. It's based on five questions, and it basically asks about what's been happening in the previous month in terms of how often you've been using uh, inhalers, how would the child rate their asthma control, what kind of symptoms they've been having in terms of wheezing, coughing, um, particularly at night time, and how often they've been feeling short of breath, whether it's several times a week, once a day, or just once or twice a week, or nothing at all. And if you've got a score of 25, you're doing absolutely fine. If it's between 20 and 24, they suggest that the control is reasonable, but if there are ongoing symptoms, then there may be help to be had, and certainly if they're scoring less than 20, then the asthma has not been well controlled. And this is quite a nice little way of judging that. The uh, Healthy London Partnership have taken that concept and just taken it a stage further, and they've used the same questions, uh, those five questions, but they've added in another three questions, which... Uh, are aimed at the parents. So they come up with a different, a different scoring system and a similar kind of sort of assessment, you know, whether you're well controlled, could have some better control, or you're poorly controlled. So this type of assessment clearly needs to be also used at acute presentation, uh, and this is clearly evidence-based. So this is the uh, most current evidence-based treatment options, um, and this is from the Royal Lake Children's Hospital WEAS pathway. So we, we know that there is grade A evidence for the use of short-acting beta agonists such as salbutamol uh, with a spacer and with a face mask in three-year-olds or under. Uh, if it's severe or life-threatening, then using the nebulized route every 20 to 30 minutes 
uh, is an option and there have been enough trials to show that using it continuously has no added advantage. In severe or life-threatening asthma, adding in ipratropium bromide if there's poor initial response given every 20 to 30 minutes for the first two hours of the attack. And there's clear evidence uh, to show that adding in ipratropium can improve the control, particularly if there's poor response to salbutamol. Uh, the use of steroid early in the attack is advocated and the evidence base for this is over 30 to 40, year old, 40 years old now and includes uh, kind of lab-based observation of upregulation of beta-2 receptors. And doses higher than those recommended have been proven in clinical trials to have no additional benefit and clearly that just increases the risk of side effects without benefit. And there is good evidence uh, giving three days is usually sufficient However, the length may need to be tailored to the number of days necessary to bring about recovery. So there's a few children who need maybe five, occasionally seven days, depending on how quickly they get better and how severe they were in the first place. There's also good evidence that giving subsequent doses at 8 a.m. limits the side effects uh, more than giving it at later times in the day. Nice also... Uh, recommends that if there is vomiting, then repeating the dose is recommended. And if this either persists or the child has very severe or life threatening asthma, then IV hydrocortisone is recommended. Now, in terms of second line treatments, There is no evidence of superiority in effectiveness or efficacy between intravenous magnesium, intravenous salbutamol bolus, or intravenous aminophilin loading bolus followed by an infusion. But there are clearly differences in tolerability and toxicity. And so, for example, aminophilin has a 10 to 20% rate of agitation and vomiting. And really kind of interestingly, the salbutamol bolus dose and infusion recommended in the children's BNF uh, has very high rates of toxic side effects. And uh, in the next few slides, we'll go through that in a bit more detail. And so that explains why magnesium is ranked first in our clinical guideline. Uh, clinical trials have shown no benefit in at this stage of using leukotriene receptor antagonists and no benefit from using nebulized magnesium in mild to moderate asthma. So let's talk a bit more about salbutamol because that's uh, really quite important. We'll start with the pharmacokinetics, which is the study of how a medication is absorbed, eliminated in its half-life and how it's distributed within the body. Um, so we know that when inhaled, Salbutamol is absorbed into the pulmonary circulation via the alveolar epithelium and therefore into the blood and it can get to the bronchial smooth muscle that way. In addition, we also know that it's transported across the uh, basement membrane from the epithelium directly onto the smooth muscle. So theoretically, you'd think that the inhaled version should work better compared to the intravenous version uh, because you're delivering it through two different routes to the same tissue. But of course we know if you've got asthma, if you've got breathing difficulties, then the delivery to 
the epithelium is attenuated by technique and so the more severe your attack there's less likely the subutum is actually going to get to either the alveolus or to the epithelium. Um, studying subutum it's not possible to determine tissue concentration levels with any uh, degree of accuracy and so generally people have used plasma levels as a surrogate marker for uh, how effective it is in terms of tissue half-life. So we know that in, in plasma, subutamol half-life is between four to six hours. So if we move on to pharmacodynamics next, um, pharmacodynamics is the study of the effectiveness and the side effects of the medication. Uh, related to the concentration in either blood or tissue levels. And the right hand chart here shows the recommended dose currently available in the adult and children BNF for intravenous salbutamol. You'll see that the bolus dose recommended for adults is 250 micrograms as a slow intravenous injection, and that for children is recommended as 15 micrograms per kilo with a maximum dose of 250 micrograms. Now, we also know that stable asthma is associated with levels of 5 to 20 nanograms per mil. With the use of more frequent inhaled salbutamol doses, the blood levels tend to go up between 20 and 40 nanograms per mil. And in adults, data suggests that levels over 30 can be associated with toxicity and that in adult data giving 300 micrograms of intravenous salbutamol uh, giving anything beyond that does not achieve any greater bronchodilation and that in fact toxicity can begin to occur when doses of greater than 200 micrograms are used and in fact any dose over 500 micrograms is really poorly tolerated and particularly in terms of cardiovascular side effects and in terms of an infusion the adult BNF suggests that the bolus is 250 micrograms and that the infusion is 3 to 20 micrograms per minute. And that equates to a bolus of 3.5 micrograms per kilo over 10 minutes if you're an average adult of 70 kilograms. And the infusion is 0 0.04 to 0 0.3 micrograms per kilo per minute in an average 70 kilo person. And that's way below what the children's BNF recommends in terms of micrograms per kilo or micrograms per kilo per minute for an infusion for children. So let's have a look in a bit more detail how this may have come about. original study done by Brown et al, um, where they used a dose of 15 micrograms per kilo as a loading dose, as a bolus for the salbutamol. Uh, Brown et al have basically said that they have extrapolated their data from a paper by Goldstein, who took 10 uh, volunteers and gave them 1.5 milligrams of salbutamol over 30 minutes, which equates to 7 micrograms per kilo over 10 minutes. Uh, but somehow Brown et al. seem to have interpreted this as 15 micrograms per kilo and not as 7. So uh, people have done some studies using modelling 
to see what uh, levels will be achieved with the current recommended regime. And you can see in this table the predicted levels following an intravenous administration. Um, and in an adult who weighs 70 kilograms, the use of 250 micrograms would lead to a maximum concentration of 7 nanograms per mil, well within that less than 20, uh, and certainly well within less than 30 that would cause toxicity. And a dose of 15 micrograms per kilo in a three-year-old would lead to really quite high, almost 30 nanograms per mil, which is you know, very much near that toxic range. Um, and the older you get, the less likely it is to be toxic. So the very young seem to be being given significantly more toxic doses. And if you look along the right-hand side, what happens if after 15 micrograms per kilo bolus, um, we decide to give an infusion of one microgram per kilo per minute. Remember the BNF suggests between one and five micrograms per kilo per minute. And that's uh, comparing to the maximum adult dose, which is three micrograms per minute. So the maximum concentrations as you can see in children are really in the toxic range, way above even 50 to 60 nanograms per mil. Um, so there appears to be you know, a fundamental error in the dosing that's quoted in the BNF. If we use this kind of modeling and understand the original research that was done and extrapolate that toxic data from adults. Furthermore, the evidence base for the current subvitamol continuous infusion uh, in children is really a very poor evidence base. It largely consists of case reports from over 30 years ago relating to children with severe asthma on a mechanical ventilator. And clearly the effectiveness and tolerability of continuous infusions has been much better uh, investigated in adult patients than it ever has been in children. And in adult patients, higher continuous infusion doses only resulted in increased cardiovascular side effects without increasing bronchodilation. So in adult patients, using a regime of 3 micrograms per minute equates to 0 0.3 micrograms per kilo per minute in children, which is a third of the lower end of the dose recommended in the BNF. And in clinical practice, we also need to take into account of the several doses of inhaled medication that are likely to have been given before children ever get to being given intravenous salbutamol. So really um, a strong case that the dosing that's been recommended is likely to be very toxic. And the original evidence base for this is extremely poor. Um, I apologize that the right hand side of this slide appears to have been cut off. But basically, I wanted to highlight that the regime for intravenous salbutamol that we recommend in our hospital is 5 micrograms per kilogram. And in fact, we have opted for magnesium as the first line uh, in the first place, uh, being aware of this kind of toxicity data. Further afield, we this is the South Thames Retrieval Service guideline for managing potentially life-threatening asthma. And as you can see highlighted in the red, they have a maximum dose of 20 micrograms per minute and a recommended range of 0 0.5 to 1 microgram per kilo per minute as treatment. 
and in fact when they get to PICU they reduce the cell glutamol as you can see in the bottom right hand corner to less than 0.5 micrograms per kilo per minute. And in their guideline they state that uh, you can see underlined in green that to help mucus plugging uh, intravenous magnesium is a useful option as a second line treatment. So that neatly brings us to discuss a bit more about magnesium and at the same time we can talk about the other second line or option of aminophilin. Here's a little pictogram showing how beta-2 agonists uh, work within these smooth muscle cells to um, cause smooth muscle relaxation. And this is a diagram taken actually from, as you can see, labelled as myometrial cells. So that's the uterine cells uh, because uterine contractions can also be stopped by using either magnesium or beta-2 agonists. And in fact, the mechanism is exactly the same. So magnesium was first used uh, as a treatment for asthma back in 1940 when a doctor, Dr. V. R. Horry, wrote a paragraph in the Journal of Laboratory and Clinical Medicine about treating two patients with low magnesium levels and severe asthma who had been requiring epinephrine, so a non-selective uh, agonist, uh, adrenergic, adrenergic agonists, so both alpha and beta, and not just beta-2 selective. And patients were requiring this treatment every four to six hours. But after treatment with magnesium, they actually remained well for over 24 hours. And the precise mechanism by which magnesium produces smooth muscle relaxation isn't known, but it is thought to act by enhancing calcium uptake in the sarcoplasmic Particulum. In addition, magnesium is a cofactor regulating a number of enzymatic and cellular activities in the body, including adenyl cyclase and the sodium potassium ATPase. So potentially this has an enhancing effect on beta-2 agonists, because you can see beta-2 agonists work on the beta-2 receptor, which then uh, reduces uh, MCL MLCK, which if you reduce that, then you reduce muscle contraction. Um, and the use of magnesium reduces uh, cell, uh, calcium, and calcium is what's required for muscle contraction. Theophylline augments the CAMP part of the beta-2 receptor pathway, so together aminophilin and uh, beta-2 agonists could be synergistic and in fact trials in the 1970s and 80s did suggest that but the trouble with aminophilin is it's easily toxic and that its pharmacokinetics are not linear so it's difficult to predict levels now the Signed guidelines assess that there is evidence from well-controlled meta-analyses for the use of intravenous magnesium in children who do not respond to first-line treatment. And they have further recommended consider adding 150 milligram magnesium sulfate to each nebulizer of subutamol and ipratropium in the first hour in children with a short duration of acute severe asthma uh, if they have SATs less than 92. There's been one well-conducted study of 163 patients where half, about 81, were randomized to amenophilin, which showed considerable benefit in children with acute severe asthma unresponsive to multiple doses of beta-2 agonists. However, the loading dose that was used in that trial was double what we normally use, which is we normally use 5 milligrams per kilo as recommended in the BNF, but that trial used 10 milligrams per kilo. And in the end, a third of the patients would have to be withdrawn.
withdrawn from the active medication because of vomiting. So that covers the options for second line treatment. There are other aspects um, in terms of managing the acute asthma and reducing morbidity and mortality. And one of those is the use of a personalized asthma action plan for discharge. Epidemiological and community-based studies have suggested that the use of these uh, is associated with a reduction of a fourfold for the likely need for emergency hospital admission. And audits of their use around the UK suggest that they are being underused. So that's a particularly important point. Another point is the need for follow-up after discharge. And in fact, I nice recommend that because of the review on child death and you know, the understanding that 90% of those have preventable factors, one of which is poorly controlled asthma. So after discharge, checking the children are well and safe. They recommend that the GP sees them within one to two days if necessary, they have a paediatric follow-up. Further, um, at the moment, I don't think this has been universally used, but I think uh, an automatic trigger of patients who use their meter dose inhalers perhaps too frequently um, is a useful way. Now, how one goes about that, that's a particular challenge. And of course, using the asthma control score, the ACS that we that I showed you earlier, is a really useful tool and an important one. Now, the really important point of discharge planning um, highlights nine practice points to consider in the appropriate discharge planning. The first one being the need to clearly document the criteria that we used to diagnose the asthma, to check that the inhaler technique is correct and the use of spacer and cleaning out of the spacers uh, being correctly understood, to discuss and to consider the need for preventer treatment if it hasn't been started, or optimising and adjusting any previously prescribed preventive treatments in light of the acute presentation. And of course, as we've already talked about, using a written personalised asthma action plan for subsequent attacks. In particular, that should include clear instructions about the use of the bronchodilators and clear instruction about when to seek urgent medical attention. Assessing triggers, so that includes in particular exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, um, so parental smoking, and this is particularly important because tobacco smoke is associated with greater neutrophilic inflammation in the airways, and neutrophilic inflammation, you may remember, is associated with more severe asthma. And so directing people to stopping smoking cessation uh, services and assessing their readiness to, uh, to go down that route is also really vital. Other triggers um, need to be also just discussed and particularly in light of if there are any present, how avoidance may be practiced. So NICE is very clear that there's no evidence to suggest uh, anti-house dust mite procedures or processes have proven benefit. So it's more around hay fever, certain pets, I guess, and foods. The importance of arranging primary care review within two working days and a 
pediatric asthma clinic follow up within one to two months and in our hospital that test so after having done all that and the court you know that's gonna be quite a tall order because it takes at least 20 to 25 minutes to do that uh, the question that I wanted to ask was is there anything else beyond first, second line and appropriate discharge planning uh, that might be on the horizon. So there are three things that I've been able to identify. Uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen, the use of non-invasive ventilation, and I just wanted to briefly highlight the use of DNAs uh, in PICU. So HFNC used in many HDU settings, PICUs around the world, and I've just taken three examples here, uh, relatively recent ones of the use of high flow in asthma. Um, and you can see in the top uh, study that uh, they were using the pulmonary score as a asthma scoring tool and they treated 60 patients, 30 with HFNC and 32 with just standard oxygen. And there's a marked difference early on in their improvement. Um, a retrospective review in, in France uh, published last year of uh, 40 tr patients treated with high flow um, suggested that there's benefit to be had in a reduced intubation rate. Um, and also another retrospective review from the United States showing its use in the emergency department and the endpoints that they were able to show was a very marked reduction in the intubation rate which was only 0.6% in the 44 patients that they had treated compared to 4% in the uh, more normally treated group. So in light of this you may be interested to hear that the respiratory team at the Alex have submitted a uh, bid for almost £200,000 for a pilot study to look at high flow nasal cannula oxygen in asthma in conjunction with Southampton and King's and uh, we'll eagerly await to see what happens to that. This is um, a review of studies using non-invasive ventilation for the treatment of asthma. And you can see that there are four studies treating status asthmaticus and the total number of patients is 96 and these are all case reports. Um, so it suggests that there's the potential role for non-invasive ventilation in status asthmaticus um, and However, there's no randomised controlled trial data of sufficient uh, to support that. So there's only been two randomised controlled trials with 20 patients in each arm when a Cochrane review was done about NIV and asthma in children in 2016. And so clearly there's a need for randomised controlled trials to reduce the risk of bias because uh, we need much larger numbers. And unfortunately, our bid for such a trial uh, was turned down by the NIHR uh, about 18 months ago. Um, so we've decided to go with high flow instead. For NIV and asthma is probably here to stay. Um, here's just an alternative source of information. This is a single PICU. Um, in France, where they've been using non-invasive ventilation in all these different categories of patients, so bronchiolitis, pneumonia, um, acute lung injury, and asthma. And the bars show what percentage of patients that attended their PICU they used NIV in, and the asthma bar represents 30 patients. And in fact, none of those patients got intubated um, in their study. 
So we'll wait to see what future shares around the uh, non-invasive ventilation. But in PICU, there's certainly also been case reports in the benefit of using intratracheal or DNA. So DNA is word digest neutrophil DNA, which is thought to cause mucus plugging, and uh, mucus plugging causes very severe asthma and life-threatening asthma and can make patients very difficult to ventilate. So trying to extrapolate whether there's a role for it in other patients. Um, there was a study done in moderate to more severe asthma uh, as a nebulizer and the graph on the right shows the difference in asthma score uh, between patients who were treated with placebo, which is in the black dots, and those treated with DNAs in the white dots, and really not much difference in that particular patient population. So for the moment, its use really is limited within PICU. Now we're coming towards the end of this presentation, so we're going to uh, begin to finish off looking at the future and clearly there are some research questions that are raised from the both sign and nice review and one of the main ones uh, is about comparing intravenous magnesium bolus with intravenous salbutamol bolus and or aminophilin to see which one uh, has better efficacy an appropriate side effect profile to be used as a sort of second line treatment after failure or first line treatment. Interestingly, NICE did say that there's a need for a trial for non invasive ventilation. Um, and the other two questions are around magnesium. So, is there a role for nebulized magnesium in hypoxic children? The magnetic trial that was done for moderate to severe asthma showed no significant benefit in moderate asthma. There was a trend towards benefit in the severe, but they didn't have enough patient numbers to really definitively prove that. Now, the other question is, is it safe and is it okay to use, uh, and is it effective to give IV magnesium? after having had a nebulized dose. So, last slide. Just want to summarize a few take home points. And that includes that 90% of asthma deaths have preventable factors. The majority of children are between the age of 10 to 18. And a large number have issues around behavior or psychological problems, anxiety, depression, familial difficulties, smoking, and uh, insufficient control of their symptoms as judged by a scoring pool. That using personalized asthma plans is recognized to reduce emergency need and that in itself could reduce deaths. Assessing the under seven year old age range where peak flows are not particularly useful um, pre presents a continuing challenge. Um, so there's, I think, certainly more work required though on the validity of the asthma severity scores that we use. And just wanted to be aware of the evidence base for the first line medication that we use, and there's strong evidence for that, but a much weaker base for the second line, and certainly almost uh, potentially dangerous recommendation in the BNF regarding salbutamol and the current levels of dosing recommended. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to just leave you with this very last slide to remind you of the different sources of information that